So do you want to have some conscious embodiment or do you just want to have the same old bloody unconscious embodiment that your dad had and his dad before him and that your culture gave you and you're supposed to have as a working class British bloke or whatever the hell you are out there? Like like that's you can just be completely unconscious with that or you can say, you know what, I choose something different. And I'm a believer of any embodied practice. If people want to do yoga or dance or martial arts, different people like different things. Great. Get in your body. Start to feel again. Stop thinking that working over porn and reading books is going to cut it. Like get into a dojo. Go do yoga. Do something. You get into your body again and reclaim that humanity. What does embodiment actually mean? Get asked that every single interview is different answers. One, you know your body is a part of you. It's not just like a pen. Something. It's a part of who you are as a person. Your body, the subjective view of the body. So the body as an aspect of our being, as an aspect of who we are as people. There's a reason if people lose an arm, they get more upset than if they lose a pen because it's part of them. Um, another term for embodiment would be the umbrella the umbrella term for all the body mind arts so i've done martial arts yoga meditation conscious dance body therapy improv body work all these things have something in common they relate to the body uh, for awareness and the body as part of who we are Um, so even though they look very different they have this thing in common so we need a sort of terminology for that you could say body mind arts you could say somatic arts embodiment is the word i tend to use Uh, so that would be another definition third definition could be a form of intelligence and we could drill down into exactly what the skill sets are within that so how's that for an opener nice man i like it considering embodiment to me is a if you ask me to define it i wouldn't really understand maybe i embody the role of a parent i embody the role of a podcaster you know um but so it's crossing the barrier between the mental and the physical whilst remaining in the body yeah, so the common sense usage is actually quite close to the technical usage. We say, you know, such and such uh, embodies leadership. We understand that there's only so much you can learn from a book. If someone said to you, you know, I've read, Chris, I've read a lot of books on kissing. I'm an amazing lover. <laughs> or, or, you know, I've looked at a lot of websites on how to drive a car. Do you want to lift Newcastle? You might say, well, hang on. That's one way of knowing. That's knowing about something, Right. So uh, I've been listening to some of your podcasts to prep for this. It tends to be the Western philosophical tradition is to think about or to know about or to learn about. And that's useful. Like it's useful for me to know the capital of France is Paris. But that's quite different from the embodied knowledge of Paris. It's quite different from, you know, having your coffee in Paris. And there's a certain kind of light that comes up in the morning and being aware of that or the French way of being, God forbid, uh, or, um, you know, that that manner of Frenchness. So this is a different kind of, of knowledge and requires a different kind of learning. So, you know, I'm at school. I read every book in the library. I was in six forms, high school for American listeners. I literally speed read every book in that library. And yet I was suicidal, drug addicted, miserable, failing at my first intimate relationships. And everyone was telling me I was really clever. They said, you've got high IQ, you know, you're a very clever guy. And I said, if I'm so clever, why am I so miserable? What has education, how has education failed me? Well, the goal goal of education, especially at that age, isn't to make you happy. Yeah, I mean, there's a sort of frame that you can say it's social conformity. But even if it were just knowledge, the sort of main view of that is you learn about things, you acquire knowledge. And it's, you know, Wikipedia hasn't solved all the world's problems, right? We've got on this phone, there's more knowledge than most human beings had in your Alexander's library or whatever, right? So it's there's all that information there. But is that the same as wisdom? And if I want to change, if I want to grow as a person... I'm going to at the very least have to acquire skills like kissing and driving or maybe even at a deeper level change who I am as a person. And while you can take a drug or go on a weekend workshop, what really works there is actually embodying something different. And that takes practice over time. I've been thinking a lot this year about the world of self-development, self-improvement. And I think a lot of the challenges that we're coming up against are given very cerebral answers. People try and think themselves out. Yep. This is a, a postmodern, post-enlightenment, scientific, utilitarian 
um, very transactional kind of environment that we're living in. And that has some wonderful advantages, unlike the Greeks who thought that bloodletting was a great way to get rid of diseases, or I think Aristotle believed that the brain only existed to get heat out of the body. You know, we've made the scientific revolution has given us some wonderful insights and drilling down into the world of personal development, self-development, a lot of the guests that I've had on this show, they do, by its very nature, we can only ever show someone or tell someone what to do. We can't do it for them. And I suppose that the um, that bifurcation in distributing what people can do versus them actually enacting it, embodying it, and doing it, is that, are we getting into some part of the framework that you look at here by seeing that distinction? Yeah, so the distinction between knowing about and knowing to do and knowing to be. I mean, if we look at the Greeks, they had the word soma, which meant the body in its wholeness, the embodied body, and they had sarx, which meant kind of a hunk of meat. And that's generally how the body is viewed as a hunk of meat. Even in a gym where you're trying to get fit, the body is an object, which is a fundamentally dehumanizing position. Uh, you know, the Greeks also had philosophy in the gym. The gymnasia wasn't a place just to lift weights. It was also a place for emotional and psychological lifting. And an embodied perspective is one which recognizes that these things are uh, deeply intertwined. You know, we, we say academic, meaning irrelevant, meaning cognitive. You know, my friend is an academic. God love him. You know, I tried to tell him about embodiment. And he was like, well, my body just gets me from one lecture to another. And I was like, dude, there's real consequences to that. You know, in his case, it's health consequences, emotional consequences. And there's a human consequence for uh, being hyper cerebral, uh, being, you know, it's not so cognocentric or sometimes here. It's a slightly pretentious way of just saying that thought is what matters and actually our embodied life, our embodied being, our you know like everything like we're building relationship right you're someone i reached out to i thought he seems like a cool guy let's get to know each other now even though we're doing that virtually the felt sense of each other is a key thing it's like is this a man i can push on and trust is this someone who's going to be fun to have a laugh with is this someone who's got backbone and spine and there's a reason we use that kind of language when we describe character and let's say i'm in the business world doing business leadership training which i've done quite a lot of They'll be very good at telling you what a leader should have and saying, you know, I've done my MBA you know, leader should be empathic and charismatic. And then you'll say, well, how do you develop that? Right. Or you'll, the philosophers, they'll say, well, man should have these virtues. Or well, Jesus said, you know, you love thy neighbor. And I, I've always thought it was kind of lacking on the detail, Chris. I've always thought it was kind of lacking on the method. So and this is where I think some of the Asian arts were. Uh, ahead of the Western knowledge in a way they had a praxis, they had a way of developing oneself. And if someone's stressed or wants to be a better leader, you know, someone's listening to this and they're lonely because of COVID or, you know, they're isolated or someone's listening to this and they're just being driven nuts by their boss, they don't really need more information. They need a practice. They need to be able to shift their way of being. I think you're very right. The fact that we believe that more knowledge is the answer as opposed to increasing our compliance to the knowledge that we already have. Every personal trainer or anyone that's ever been to the gym knows that it's not really that much about what diet or what training plan you follow versus whether you follow it consistently over a long enough period of time. If you do anything long enough, you'll get good at it. Now, the hope is that the thing that you do for long enough to get good at it isn't drugs or isn't cheating on your partner or whatever it might be well, um just just to bookend something you mentioned there you talked about the greeks and about how the gymnasia was this place that was not only one of physical being but uh, of mental being as well did you know that plato's real name wasn't plato what was his real name keith i really no, thankfully not there was also there was no keiths born in the uk in 2018 that's another they're a dying breed um aristocles it was claimed that Plato's real name was Aristocles and that Plato was a nickname that translates to roughly the broad, derived either from the width of his shoulders, the results of training for wrestling, or the breadth of his style, or from the size of his forehead. So hopefully it's from the broadness of his shoulders, not the size of his forehead. Yeah, and you know, this is throughout history. People have talked about how, you know, uh, what George Washington sat on a horse, or, you know, Nelson Mandela was a boxer. There's, there's, there's not the only one. 
But uh, this has been lost somewhat if we look at our kind of current uh, crop of politicians or corporate trainers. And you mentioned practice. Like we're all practicing something. Like everyone out there listening to this, maybe you've got, you know, YouTube on your phone where you're taking a shit. Maybe you're walking down the street. Maybe, you're, you know, you've got it on in the car. You're practicing a way of being. Like I interview people for my podcast and you see their way of being all the time. So as soon as someone comes on, some people are like, right, in your, right in your face. Other people are like, oh, let me examine this. Some people are wide and they're like big, you know, like Americans can be. There's a cultural embodiment, you know, like, hey. And other people, you know, you had Douglas Murray on. I was like, you know, Douglas has his particular Douglasness, doesn't he? And it's, it's, it's very particular. It's a flavor. And, there's a way, and, and that is great for some things and rubbish for others. So my, my general approach to personal growth, whether it's business, yogis, life coaches, whoever I'm working with, is awareness, range, and choice. So first thing is we need to know what we're doing. What's the default, right? Like most people don't know which way they cross their arms, but then you try it both ways, you know, and you go, ah, okay, that's really uncomfortable. Oh, dealt with your fingers, yeah? So you, this is like your personality. There's, you can you can lean forwards, lean back, and people can try this. Go on the balls of their feet and then on the heels. You know, it's like go up. You know, some people, they're kind of all up here, aren't they? And they're either very anxious or they're like, dude, like totally spacey, like in Northern California. Or, you know, my family are like Irish potato people. They're right down here in the earth. You know, and you see this in different parts of England. You know, some's more grounded. Like up north, it tends to be a bit more grounded. And in south, a bit more up here. Uh, so there's cultural factors. Not everyone, because there's individual factors too. There's situational factors. There's relational factors. These are all going on in embodiment. So I don't know if you're like this all the time. This is the first time I've seen you, right? So, I, Or if you're just like this when you do interviews. So there's all these different aspects of embodiment. But if we bring some awareness to that, maybe we can try something different. The first place that anyone has to go with any type of change, presumably, is cultivating a sense of awareness of what they're doing at the moment. Know thyself. Nothing new. Where yeah. do we go next? Choice. So this is the difference between mindfulness and embodiment. Mindfulness is like, be aware of your state. And it's like, oh, I'm really angry, right? And it's like, well, hang on a minute. I've got a meeting with my staff. This is a real example. Absolutely pissed off with something, really angry. And then it was like, well, I don't want to bring that to my team. That's not going to be a helpful state to bring to my team. So then, then we become, the philosophy won't help you here, but the physiology will. So here we then have the physiological shift. So maybe it's, you know, I put my feet on the ground, oh, I come back in my chair, I soften my jaw, I let my peripheral vision open up, I take a, a deep belly breath. And, you know, people listening can try this if they want. You, don't, you can do this with your eyes open driving a car. Oh, okay, tell me again, what was it you were saying, Chris? So that ability to shift state is so key and you know you don't want to be that guy on the high street shouting saying i'm not angry he doesn't even know he's angry but if he did know he's angry he'd still have a second thing to do which would be to shift it if he wanted or he could express it which is another skill that's another embodied skill a lot of my fellow english men lack is the ability to express themselves you know like I, I lived in brazil for a while in the slums of brazil working there and i, I got back and i was just more fluid and relaxed. my mom was like where did you get those hips you know <laughs> and it's like i learned it i lived above the nightclub for six months in brazil did nothing but fucking fight and dance for six months and i came back and it was like there was a different embodiment because i'd been you know you know this like you go on holiday for a week even you can start to soak up the embodiment or you go down to london from newcastle it's a different vibe right yeah, very much so. Very, very much so. So we've got awareness to begin with. We need to know that we are X. And I'm going to guess that this could be uh, macro or micro, that we are angry in the moment or that we are perhaps unhappy or frustrated over time. State and trait. So awareness of state is easy. You can feel it. That's mindfulness. Awareness of trait is invisible. It's like the taste of your own mouth. You have to have it pointed out or you have to do some kind of comparison to feel the difference. So the guy who's always angry doesn't feel angry. <laughs> That's just his, his, it's like comfortable underpants. He's, you know, you've, you've gotten used to it. You know, like, am I wearing, I don't, I'm not even wearing anything. I haven't worn any for ages. But it's like you're used to that embodiment. So you have to step out of it to feel it. It might not, it might only be by stepping out of the anger because, shit, I'm spending a lot, I'm angry most of the time. I didn't even realize. Everybody else can see it. That he can't state is much easier it's like being tired or being energized or 
you know, like I noticed like, oh, I'm a little bit nervous for this interview. Not a lot, but a little bit. Okay. Might want to slow down a little bit, Mark. So if I can notice my state, I can change it. Trait. I'm yeah. I'm, I'm going to guess that knowledge or the learning is going to help us more moving from step one to step two rather than just being step one. Step one of the awareness of either our state or trait is simply cultivating a mindfulness of what is happening either in that moment or what has changed over time. But moving on to step two, which is... Choice. 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 Awareness and choice. But you don't necessarily know... You mentioned the man that is angry, even if he becomes aware of his anger needs to learn or needs to have a particular process that he can follow in order to uh, enact that anger, to release that anger, to deal with that anger, to do whatever. So I guess that you do require some knowledge in the choice section. Yeah, and I'm not anti-knowledge. I love what the West brings in terms of science and the Renaissance. I love the fact that we can dissect things. And, you know, I'm a geek for this stuff. Like, I'll look at practices and I'll say, okay, you can try. You, you're you kind of, I'm coaching this, like, Russian business guy today. And it's like, he's kind of a bit stiff, you know? And I'm like, okay, you could try conscious dance. You could try improv comedy. You know, I could just give you a little exercise to do at home that just takes two minutes because you're a busy guy. You know, this is where we get geeky and this is where a bit of expert knowledge can come in to know how to shift but pe people are also pretty intuitive about this stuff like you know i could take someone to say let's say there's a young woman who's lost her confidence this happens to a lot of girls in teenage years their embodiment kind of folds over they get these kind of round shoulders they, they lose that natural confidence kids have now someone like that they know what it's like to be confident because they've seen it and at some point in their life they've done it even if they only do it one day in a hundred so actually, people know, you know, like if I say to a little kid, which direction is happy? Sounds like a weird question, but the, I asked that to a seven year old and they jumped up in the air. Right. Like which direction is angry? Is it tight or is it relaxed? Well, most people would go, OK, it's forwards and tight. Yeah. Like people can figure this stuff out. I mean, I have maps for it. And I, you know, as I said, I geek out about it. But um, it's our, it's our human inheritance, really, to know this stuff. So we've got choice. And what's third? That's it. There's awareness, there's awareness, range and choice. So range means you can actually have some options. That's kind of the middle ground. Sometimes I say awareness, acceptance and choice. So this is the paradox of change that we need to know how we are and then say, OK, that is how I am. And right now I'm scared. Or right now I'm angry. <sighs> Saying yes to that, you know, I was listening to your man on who is stoic guy, you know, being able to accept things is a really important skill. And then moving to do I want to change something? Can I change something? Am I going to take the time to develop myself? And um, maybe that's a small practice, like walking a little bit more. Um, you know, you see some people, they're walking, their arms are vapid. They take small steps. You know, their practice could be walking to work every morning with just a little bit more push from the back foot, swinging the arms just a little bit more. It's going to like every day for 10 minutes, you know, and then we have the relational side. Okay. So we have awareness and choice for self. But then what about other people? Before we get on to that, um, sure. there may be people who are naturally or trained to be more utilitarian, very pragmatic, and they yeah. will say, well, that's all well and good, Mark, telling me to walk a little bit more off my heels and stand up straight with my shoulders yeah, yeah. back like Jordan Peterson. But that's that's just a physical movement. That's me just drilling. Yeah, yeah. You're telling me to walk a particular way. That doesn't change anything about me other than my gait. Yeah. So the first thing I'd say is don't believe a word I say. OK, first thing I'd say is uh, try these things. I mean, I could be some cult leader lying to you for my own you know, financial benefit or something. Right. So um, don't believe me like that would be nice. I mean, who, who the hell am I? I'm just some guy from the Internet. So I would say try it. You know, I've, for example, like I get some guy to do star jumps, jumping jacks, they call them in America and say, tell me you're sad. It's just impossible. Right. <laughs> it's, it's like okay, Unlike like if you get someone to do burpees and no one's happy. If you make You're them right, do right. burpees, no one's happy. If you make them do burpees, star jumps, they're sad. Or here's another one. Someone's tired, and I say, right, well, you could do chest breathing for three breaths, right? <sighs> okay, do you feel more or less tired? 99.9% .9 of people are saying, I feel more awake. I feel less tired, right? Don't believe me. Like, test this stuff. You know, and if, if you if you have enough trust after a few of these little tests to do a bigger test, like taking up tango dancing or taking up karate or, you know, taking up whatever salsa dancing, whatever it is, and then see how it changes your life. And um, like, that's my philosophy. Like, you know, how it's not a religion. Yeah, I uh, 
really enjoyed this insight I got from Derek Sivers earlier on this year, founder of CD Baby, a oh, yeah. really, really insightful guy. And he uh, he talked about most books are spending their time convincing you that the author's word is worth trusting. The vast majority of books are either context or justification. <laughs> um, and what's, what's really interesting about yeah. that, and it was an, an insight that I'd never heard, I've riffed quite a lot this year on a lot of books are blog posts that should have been a tweet expanded out into 200 right. pages. Nice. But what Derek hit upon that I really, really enjoyed is that most books have a, a one particular key insight, but the problem is that you don't trust the author enough to believe it. So they have to they have to give you all of these different examples. Like if your best friend whose last five pieces of advice for you about relationships or the horse that you should pick or whether you should move house or that job or whatever, if they just gave you gold advice and they came up and said, well, mate, here's the central, the central thrust of, and just said the um, bottom line impact of a particular book, you'd be like, yeah, cool. But when it's a stranger, that's not the case. And yeah, there needs to be authority and trust, right? So, precisely. And those are embodied phenomena as well. I mean, there's a reason, you know, British Airways, when they say, you know, tonight or today we'll be flying at 10,000 feet and blah, 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 and your mother would probably find me attractive. You know, there's a there's a, there's a a embodiment to the British Airways voice, for example. Now, if they were like, hello, welcome to British Airways. Um, we're going to Malaga. I hope it's going to be fine. I mean, just the anxiety. You'd hear that fight or flight response and you wouldn't trust that guy. So... I mean, one's embodiment of these two factors, warmth and power. So one one factor is like, is this person authoritative? Are they competent? Mm -hmm. Now we can base that on past experience. Like, you know, I've listened to your podcast, so I know you're a competent interviewer, for example, right? I can base that on that experience. However, if I didn't, I would get that sense from the first three seconds of this interview because you're relaxed. You're like, I know what I'm doing. You know, this is home base for me. Welcome to my home, you know, <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. I do this all the time. You know, it's episode, whatever it is, 250, you know, and then there's warmth, right? But if you just did power, you'd be like, okay, Mark, fuck you. I'm in charge. I know what's going on. You know, like, like I'm the boss here. And then I'd be like, oh, I'm feeling uncomfortable. I don't, I don't feel very relaxed. So it's all, you know, with children, with horses, with human beings generally, like this is just what we need to convey. And these are embodied capabilities. Cool. Uh, so we, we've looked at the individual. And yes. then relation, yeah, relational. Yeah. Life's about relationship, right? If we're just on our own in a cave, it's not a very satisfying life for most people. So it's the same thing. This is the embodiment skill set, embodied intelligence, I sometimes call it. Um, awareness and choice. Then we have self and other. So other, we have awareness of other, and that is state and pattern. Same thing, okay, state and trait. So it's can I look at someone and go, are you all right? Like I was talking to my colleague yesterday, and I just went, are you okay? And she went, Actually, my mum's in hospital and my housemates hate me. And it's like she just needed to listen, you know, 10 minutes of me listening to her before we could get on with the business meeting. It was fine. And I didn't mind at all. But had I not caught just in my gut, in my own my empathy is embodied without embodiment, you're psychopathic. Right. Like if you're not feeling and we all have this experience, maybe, you know, on the tube or walking through a crowded street or when we're stressed or in a rush, we lose empathy because our body tightens. We lose the ability to resonate. Yeah, you've had that experience, right? I've just been a bit of a dick. And then afterwards going, I'm sorry, I was stressed. I shouldn't have said that. And you'd lost the empathy in that moment. Yeah. So when we're relaxed and we're open and we're centered in ourselves, we've done the stuff we just talked about. We've got some chance of resonating with other people. In this case, realizing my, realizing my colleague wasn't very well and you needed a bit of listening to him. So that's the, the listening side, the empathy. And then, and then there's body reading, right, where we can look at different patterns. And that's always a guess, and it's to be approached with humility. But in a way, it's common sense. You know, you're walking down the street, someone's there, and you go, ah, oh, this doesn't feel good, right? You get so either in your own body or you see something in that, you know, they're looking around, they've got a certain muscle tone, they've got a certain tension in their body, their breathing's a certain way, and you go, maybe best cross the road, <laughs> Yeah. So it's like, you know, I worked in war zones for years, and I got quite attuned to this. I spent a lot of time watching people who I didn't really speak their language or I was just learning their language, like Brazil, East Africa, Middle East, Afghanistan. And I go, is this safe? So I was quite motivated to figure out whether they were shouting because that was just their culture and like, you know, like in the Mediterranean, some people shout, or was it that they were angry and this could be a dangerous situation? And the other thing is just touching a lot of bodies. If you touch a lot of bodies, you start to get a different felt sense of them. So I was traveling around the world doing martial arts 
um and after touching several thousand bodies like in in quite intimate ways in some ways you start to get a bit of a better felt sense of people than the average person um so that's that's the the sort of third of the four capabilities which is awareness of other people I did for a long time when I was a kid. I did Lao Ga Kung Fu, which is a southern style of Kung Fu, very popular. Yeah. Um, and I did that to brown sash. And a big part of that is sticking hands. Yes. So, with that, anyone who doesn't know what that is, it looks a little bit like a dance. You have your wrists on my wrists from your right on my left, my left on your right. And we, yeah, we roll, we roll our wrists between each other. And what you're waiting for. As you're moving forward, the other person will move backwards. And as they move towards you, you'll move backwards. And what you're waiting for is a break. If that person breaks contact with your wrists and you're flowing backwards and forwards, left and right in circles, and then you'll reverse the circles and you're waiting for a break. And at that break is an opening at which you can then move into that person. But if you move into them when they're still touching you, they know you're moving and they can reverse that particular move and then you'll end up being struck. So that insight incredibly intimate you use the word intimate there which is one that comes sort of quite heavily loaded but it's really correct you know that was some of the most intimate understandings that i got of how other people's bodies worked and really you know sort of being honest other than proper body work that i've had done to me or that i've said oh hey mate like you back to in like give me i'll give you a hand other than that or you know much more intimate sort of passionate relationship stuff you don't uh, had I not have done that, my understanding, my genuine felt understanding of what other people's bodies are and how they move would be significantly lower. And I know that doing Lao Ga Kung Fu is an outlier. You know, it's not like you... you... Well, it's a great sensitivity, right? It doesn't surprise me you've done martial arts, by the way. You can feel that in a person. You know, it's, it's, there's a way in which someone carries themselves even years afterwards when they've had that character training. And some, you know, some practices have that sensitivity. Sometimes people learn a physical skill and it never really transfers into their life, you know? What like? Any any particular physical skills that you see in people that don't tend to translate across much? Yeah, it's so, I mean everything, but let's take let's say you spend let's take a popular practice, yoga. So people could get very good at being calm in yoga and then walk out of yoga, pick up their phone, go on Facebook and immediately start a flame war. Now, they've got had a little bit of a holiday from their life in yoga, and they've had a bit of calming down, which is, you know, it's good for all of us. So good luck to you if that's what you want to do. But they haven't really learned any skills. They haven't really transferred any skills across from yoga um, into their life, which is kind of a pity. And there's, there's ways I, you know, point out for my yoga students about how to increase the transfer or else, you know, particularly it's, it's a particular container, say an Aikido school or a yoga school. It's got its own clothes, its own ritual, its own words. You know, the, the, the stay with the phone example. There's no mobile phones, right? So I spend about an hour a day on my mobile phone, at least, I'd say. So I might have, let's say I've learned a breathing exercise, like belly breathing, diaphragmatic breathing. Well, why don't you try that with your phone? And if that's too easy, get your email on your phone and then see if you're still breathing, right? And we can actually train that as a transferable skill so that's one of the things i do with students we'll start with like let's say we're training the stress response so we'll we'll start with throwing a tissue at them throwing a kleenex at them and they they flinch right i mean it actually even works online you want to try <laughs> want to try yeah sure <laughs> okay what did you do in your body when i threw that at the camera yeah you want to move backwards you want to jerk backwards did you, did you move backwards yes or no uh, a little bit yeah yeah a little bit and you tensed up probably a little bit too right yeah. And your breathing changed a little bit? A little short, sharp breath in. Okay, great. So good noticing you have higher body awareness than a lot of the beginning. Uh, that, that would already indicate to me you had some real practice behind you already. And then you would get with building your awareness of that fight flight response. Then we could give you a technique to work with it. It could be something as simple as, um, uh, can I offer you one now, Chris? Is that all right? Like a little Fire technique. away, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your, your eyes are quite narrow. It may be you're just looking at the camera. It may just be today. I don't know. But try uh, opening up your vision so you can see all around the computer, not just the computer. Mm-hmm. Soften your jaw a little bit. We call this the Russian smile in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> Say, ah. 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 Okay, what happened that time when I threw the tissue? Nothing. No, a whole lot less, right? So we actually just trained you to reduce your fight flight response. Now, throwing tissues at you is completely pointless. <laughs> but what we could do, and I won't do this online because it's a bit personal, 
we could train to take this into a coaching environment and we could use a situation like a piece of criticism or something stressful maybe your girlfriend criticizes you or your mom or your boss and we could then train that to a again notice the response and b to then reduce that response so this is the reducing the fight flight response because it's usually not helpful unless you know you've got a heavy rock to lift or something it doesn't really help for our social interaction um or we could work with expressing it, right? That would be a whole other set of practices. Cool. Just to close that open loop that we've got, there will be a lot of people listening. <laughs> uh, there'll be a lot of people listening who do yoga and are mm. thinking, oh, fucking hell, Mark's rumbled me there. Um, I, I, I do really enjoy my practice. I do feel very mindful, very embodied, very centered when I'm doing my yoga. And yet, you're mm. right, I, I really struggle in x situation in traffic when i get out when i have this that and the other how can people that are practicing yoga or similar other practices transfer that across into their day-to-day -day life yeah that is the question i've spent my life really looking at that so first of all i'm not slagging off yoga if anyone's enjoying yoga if it gives you a break if it makes you less stress great keep doing it good for you no problem i like yoga so i want to say that first of all because otherwise people think you're kicking their puppy a little bit you know it's um people get very attached to practices because they help people um, so how to transfer it. One, notice what you do 10 minutes before and 10 minutes after class. So bring in a bit of an awareness to, for example, I've seen people be really abusive to the person at the desk and like just unpleasant as they go paying for their cars and then go into yoga and sit down and start saying, oh, ah, yeah, exactly. and it's like, dude, not even 10 <laughs> minutes before you were being mean to someone. Yeah. Right. So we can open up before and after. Uh, another thing you can have reminders. So, you know, iPhones are great for this. You just set your phone to go off five times a day. When it goes off, you do one yoga breath, one full yoga breath, five times a day. Okay, there's another one. Another one, micro poses. So if, if you've got YouTube, they can look all this up. It's much easier to show than tell, but there's something called embodied yoga principles where we explore this on YouTube. Um, you, you have warrior pose, right? How do you get warrior pose into your life? You find the way of doing that on a small level. So this takes me five, 10 minutes to train a yogi in, and we can take a pose they know really well and we can then take it into walking, standing, and talking. And I'll say, right, ask me for a cup of tea in warrior pose. Right, ask me for a cup of tea in the opposite of warrior pose. How would you walk like a warrior? And they go, well, you know, I'd move my arms, I'd extend from my back leg, I'd look straight ahead. Okay, I go, great, do that. And then we've taken warrior pose as a sort of bad bit of exercise into stretch, in from stretching into something they can use in conversation, something they can use as a practice walking down the street, something they can use to stand slightly differently without looking too weird. Now we've made it into transferable practice. There's, there's about 10 other things, but there's um, it's three for starters. That's some nice takeaways. You mentioned that we were at three out of four. Yeah, so we've done awareness and choice self, and we did other awareness, so it's empathy and, and body reading, but we didn't do influence. So really it's just based on the other three. So how do you calm someone down or wake them up yeah or make them laugh or turn them on or whatever the influence you want to have on someone else is that's through the body I, i'll give you an example of this i was i work in russia a lot i was just there now actually and um i have an interpreter and my interpreter is very polite um slightly nervous very particular young lady called julie and it's quite difficult because i'll say da -da 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 -da, and she'll say da -da 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 -da, and it completely changes the message so she's actually, to her credit, she's learned my embodiment and she kind of steps into it. And another example from there, when I make a joke, people laugh before she translates it. Why? Because the embodiment is what's being conveyed. Yeah. And, and this is what we do all the time. Like I used to work with kids a lot. I used to work in like, you know, you know PGL, like outward education and big groups of kids running around the woods. Lots of fun. And, you know, you have to hold their authority. That's a body thing. It almost doesn't matter what you say. You know, like my best mate, he'll I haven't seen him in ages. He'll see me once or twice a year back home and he'll say, Mark, you're the biggest knobhead I've ever met in my life. You're such a wanker. But what his body's saying is, I love you and I missed you. You know, this is proper British bloke thing to do. And that's actually, I can tell that's what his body's saying because my body relaxes and it opens. Does it make sense? Yeah. So this, this is the fundamental way we influence people. Like, you know, let's say you're interested in attraction. Maybe there's guys or women out there and they, you know, they're interested in being more attractive. Now you can wear some clothes and get a haircut and maybe learn some pickup lines. But if you're not embodying 
uh, attractive qualities, you won't even be looked at. You won't even be looked at by women or men. And as soon as you have those, it's just like you can be wearing the dirty T-shirt with food on it and have your hair all over the place. And you've all got a mate like that. Isn't he annoying? You know, who kind of had that naturally. He never had to learn it. He had that. We call it charisma or chemistry or, you know, chemistry is an embodied thing. If you and your partner's love life has gone. And I've worked with gay community a lot in Russia as well. So this works with gay people, too. But if you you and your partner, your love life has gone a bit flat. It's you've lost polarity. That's embodied. You know, if, if you're yang and she's yang or you're yin and she's yin, that's not it's not really going to help. So can you actually step into that polarity, step into that where you can influence them? And um, this is an embodied skill. I mean, tremendously useful for any kind of leaders or influencers. What are the biggest challenges that people come up against when trying to improve their influence? <sighs> they're not basing it on the other stuff. So they, they go, try and go straight to the tricks and they're not basing it on their own self-awareness, self-regulation and empathy. Um, so they need to sort of, they sort of come to me and say, look, I, I'm fine, but everyone else is fucked up. All right. <laughs> All right. Maybe let's look at that, you know? So, um, yeah, that's probably the biggest challenge and just not being in their bodies. I mean, if, you know, it's like, hello, I'm Norman. I'm your manager. I'm completely in my head. I've got no embodied presence. I'm not feeling anything and I'm trying to inspire you today. You know, just not having any kind of passion or embodied presence at all, that that's not going to be helpful. I put in my newsletter a couple of weeks ago that you are the common denominator in your life. Boom. What is what <laughs> is more likely? All of your relationships end badly, let's say, or your boss always seems to like you or mm. you always seem to be much better with money than all of your friends or... Um, you just never get invited out to parties, whatever it might be. <laughs> Wherever you go, there you'll be. Like That's you're, what I've been saying, right there. You're, there you are. you're always going to, you are the common denominator in your life. And I, I know it's hard. It's hard for everyone to hear because it feels so bestowed on you, right? Like whatever the common threads are that exist in your life, they manifest in your mind like a, a curse that's been thrown down from the heavens. And that's also the way that our emotions then the manifest mind. them, right? You know, the, the feeling of love is oxytocin. Love the, is an action done in the body. So, but the way that you sense it, the way that it actually manifests when you try and think and break it down and you feel it in your chest and you feel the warmth, that doesn't feel anything like just a chemical getting released. And sure. the same thing goes for the situations that occur in your life. The challenges that you face feel like they've been bestowed upon you. And the successes that you've faced also for people dealing with imposter syndrome feel like they've been bestowed upon you too. Yeah, I mean, personal responsibility is the first thing I teach all my new employees. It's when I, you know, we just took a big team on for the conference we were talking about earlier. And the first thing I taught them was personal responsibility. It's like, you know, in, in embodiment, we call it somatic responsibility. It's like no one made you angry you made you angry i mean you know you might say hey he made me angry and as a shorthand that's fine but really it's i did anger in my body this is from paul linden one of my main teachers uh, i did anger in my body when he said x right like that even if it was an unconscious choice was a choice and then actually it's radical to take responsibility over yourself and there are that's the conservative truth right the personal responsibility the liberal truth is equally important to balance which is that there are conditions and those conditions might be intergenerational trauma, it might be poverty, it might be whatever the this, you know, living in Moscow, it might be that you haven't eaten breakfast that's more, that morning. There's lots of conditions, right? So we have to acknowledge both of those things, the conditions and the responsibility. And for me, embodiment is um, a great way to take responsibility over myself and, you know, get out of that victim position. I want to get onto the embodiment conference in a little bit. But before we do that, can you try and give us some more common embodiment techniques the most common ones that you use with your clients or that you've been that you've been taught that you think the broadest cross-section of people that i know can probably benefit from some of these yeah great so i mean we've got state changes and then we've got how do we develop ourselves as people there's no quick wins for the second one okay like the second one you want to develop yourself as a person get a practice start going to karate or to tango or conscious dance you know, do meditation every morning. Great. That's a long term project. But people often need the quick wins first so they can have some sort of state change, which is fair enough. So stand differently, walk differently, sit differently, breathe differently. There you go. That's about it. Breath, 
do you want to breathe a bit more in the chest or a bit more in the belly? That will have a different impact. Which do we want? Well, it depends what you want it for. So when everyone talks about good breathing or good posture, my next question is, well, what for? So if I'm trying to go to bed at night and I want to go to sleep, long, smooth out breath. Yeah, that's chamomile tea breath. If I want to wake myself up in the morning, espresso breath. I was in bed this morning. I had five hours sleep. I need to get up to see my team. I was like, okay, just one, one breath. Sometimes you only got two or three seconds, right? I did that, got out of bed. Okay, simple get up technique. Whoa, I'm like, I feel I'm awake from doing it just now. And then like this evening, it's like, what are we at? Like, it's like, oh, we've got a few hours yet, but there'll be a, oh. And that makes me just go to sleep. Just, I don't want to do that too much, actually being interviewed. So there's two breaths for you right away. We could say yang and yin, belly and long out breath versus the in breath. Uh, how do you stand? Do you want to take up space or do you want to be more private? More width or less width? more forwards do you want to be more engaged like as an interviewer right you can be more engaged hey mark tell me that or you can be more back evaluating taking your space yeah and we can go up and down do you want to be more down which is like grounded solid Mm, stubborn we will fight them on the beaches yeah or do you want to be more up here more like lively and inspired and light and fun and well depends when right like maybe you want to be serious now you're at work but later on you're relaxing you know you're having fun with your friends at the pub you want to be a bit more up up above so we can use posture walking i've mentioned simple ass techniques you're someone like me who tends to rush walk a bit slower walk more on the heels you're someone that lacks confidence walk with a slightly lo- it doesn't have to be monty python just a slightly longer stride push from your back foot a little bit more yeah look up you know, the Jordan Peterson thing about, you know, stand up tall. I mean, it's not wrong. It's just not very detailed, right? It's just it's, it's fine. It's just, you know, I did a video on what could be added to that. Um, so what have we done? Sitting. Again, you know, how do you want to sit? Posture, breathing, movement. So these are basic tools. Um, and then we can look a bit more esoterically, you know, like or a bit more creatively. Like, um, like right now, imagine, visualize the hand of someone supportive on your back. Someone from your past, a teacher, or maybe a dad or a grandparent. And lean into that. Yeah, you just shifted. How was that? It's a nice cue. Nice, huh? So you can have a visualization. Like sometimes I'm, you know, visualize you're on fire, visualize you've got angel wings, visualize your uh, feet are trees. I mean, you know, some people love visualization, but other people it doesn't work for. Um, so yeah, or we can say, okay, like um, one of my translator, Julia in Moscow, God love her, she's one of my best friends now. She says um, when she wants to be more confident and kick ass, she's, she's kind of like, you know, she does a sort of her inner Mark Walsh and she sort of moves and stands a bit like me. And if I want to be sort of nice and polite and a bit less offensive, I can be a bit more like Julie, right? Like that's like a mode because I'm quite familiar with Julie from years of standing next to her. I can just, it's like channel, but there's nothing weird about it. It's just, I'm bringing that person to mind. Ah, there's a body. There's a, a this quality with Julie, e, a particularness. Yeah? And I, I change as soon as I start to put that on. But all this stuff is just hacks, right? And I, in, you know, in my book, plug, uh, there's a whole chapter on sort of, on sort of um, hacks and like little quick wins you can do, things you can do as you get in a chair, self-coaching. Uh, it doesn't have to be complicated. You know, the iPhone that goes off and reminds you to breathe, that sort of thing. But really, if I'm working with people long term, it's the practices. It's what are you really practicing? And yes, we can give you shapes to practice, yoga shapes and poses. Uh, but it's something like, you know, you mentioned your your kung fu practice. You know, that has stayed with you. That has stayed with you years later because you put the hours in. And I th- like, let's grow up. Yes, it's nice to go and do some ayahuasca or mushrooms. Yes, it's nice to jump up and down and, you know, do a workshop and, you know, pump the air and feel good. But unless you're really developing a practice, that stuff's not going to stick. Let's let's get real. All the books in the world won't solve your problems. I can listen to a thousand podcasts from me or from you and learn about Stoic philosophy and listen to Douglas Mark Murray and all these great thinkers. But unless I develop a practice, I'm not changing. That difference between state and trait, I think, is a really good point to make. And again, it comes back to the the transactional nature of what the self-development world has has come to. And we try as much as possible to talk about compliance on this show to try and remind people that what you do every day is what you'll end up becoming. Yeah, uh, There's a, a concept which you might love, actually, with the martial arts reference from Ethan Suplee, 
my buddy who was in Wolf of Wall Street, big, huge Hollywood oh, actor, massive okay. guy out of um, My Name is Earl, and now he's lost 300 pounds, mm-hmm. and he's got a beard, and he wears his cap on backwards, and he deadlifts like 500 pounds, and he's just he's a beast. Um, and he was learning martial arts for some huge blockbuster that he was in, and the martial arts instructor that he had gave him a rule, which is called no bad reps. And okay. no bad reps is a really smart way to remind us that you're always drilling something. Yes. The way that myelin sheaths wrap around the um, neurology, neurology? Yeah, neurology of how the myelin sheaths wrap around in your brain isn't that you don't get to choose not to make a habit. You just get to choose which habit it is that you're yes. making. Got this something really is wiring together right now. Everyone listening to this right now, something is wiring together. Neurons something that wire together. together. They're gonna. They're gonna. They're gonna. They're firing together right now. They're wiring together right now. So, do you want to have some conscious embodiment, or do you just want to have the same old bloody unconscious embodiment that your dad had and his dad before him, and that your culture gave you, and you're supposed to have as a working class British bloke or whatever the hell you are out there? Like, like that's, you can just be completely unconscious with that. Or you can say, you know what? I choose something different. And I'm a believer in any embodied practice. If people want to do yoga or dance or martial arts, different people like different things. Great. Get in your body, start to feel again. Stop thinking that wanking over porn and reading books is going to cut it. Like get into a dojo, go do yoga, do something that you get into your body again and reclaim that humanity. What are some suggestions you've got? People think, yeah, yeah, uh, Mark Feller was all right. Like he, he's th- that embodiment stuff sounds pretty good. First off, let's say that we're in COVID, which we are. Um, yeah. What can or should what would be a good suggestion for people to start? And then let's say that we're back into the real world. What are some things perhaps that people have overlooked that would be a little bit more left field? Okay, if they're a complete beginner, if they're pretty cerebral, like my academic friend any movement practice that involves feeling whatever's comfortable and happy and inspires you whether it's martial arts dance yoga whatever okay you can do that at home the zoom classes and all these things now are actually more available than ever before so that you know getting up from your chair this i don't like you can see i'm getting antsy i don't like sitting still for an hour you know i normally move around a lot more um being in nature being around other embodied people they're the key factors but movement is the first one do some simple things, even if it's just 10 minutes of mindful breathing a day, a little bit of mindful barefoot walking on the grass in the park. That's what I do. Um, and then if you feel inspired, do a class. If people are listening to this and they already have a practice, next level, examine it. Is it transferring? Question one. Is your yoga or your cry or whatever getting off the mat? Yeah. Question two. Is your practice chosen from your neurosis and just making you more and more like how you are? Maybe you actually need a second practice. Like I did martial arts for ages. I got very disciplined. You know, I got that Japanese thing that I needed to get my ass sober and to, you know, give me that structure in my body. But then I got a bit uptight and I needed to go to fire rhythms and let it all hang loose and dance and be free. You know, so there's like different things. If you've already got one practice, you might want to look at a second one. And what's a more left field suggestion when the world reopens? Well, other than let's all have an orgy in Newcastle, I think, um, <laughs> you know, in this in the snow. I think I think I'll all go clubbing in Newcastle and have a great time. That that would be my guest list available. Text below. Um, you mentioned right about like in, interpretive <laughs> dance and 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 yeah. comedy and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. You know, all of these different practices might the horses for courses. But getting into the body, I I, I really like that idea. I, I think as well this year more than ever, I've noticed the lack of variety in the movements that I've been able to do. You know, I haven't been, no no one's been going to a nightclub in 2020. No one's been really spending a ton in the UK. We weren't even allowed to go out of the house. You could maybe barefoot on the wall, on the grass once per day. Yeah. Unless you got Unless you got a garden, people been locked in their houses. You know, you live in a city. It might be a fair distance for you to get to some nature. So I think that there's a good, a really good case to be made that, taking yourself out of your mind. And I'm going to make a pejorative statement about the vast majority of people who choose to listen to podcasts and consume this type of content in any case. I think that'll select for a particularly cerebral type of person already. I think they'll exist a lot more in their head than they will in their body. And I certainly know that I do as someone who thinks that he's trying to push these boundaries already. So I, I definitely agree. I think there's a lot that can be taken from the embodiment practice. 
Yeah, you know, a man should be well danced and well fought as well as well read. And I, I love reading, you know, just loaded books behind me, ordered about five yesterday. I'll probably get around to reading two of them if I'm lucky. I love reading, but we need something more than that if we're going to grow as people. We need a practice. We need some way to get back in our bodies. And as you say, in these times, I think it's particularly important. We, you know, we're in this slightly disembodied world right now. And um, yeah, I, I'd encourage people to whatever embodied practice appeals to them, give it a go. I love it. Tell us about your conference. Okay, so we have a huge conference coming up. Uh, where to begin? I love embodiment. I think it's a good thing. I'd like to see it out in the world. Uh, I've been putting stuff out on you know, online, on YouTube, on my podcast, embodiment for free. And then I went, hang on a minute, we could do an online event. Two years ago, we did it for the first time. Everyone laughed at us because no one knew what Zoom was then. 15,000 people turned up. And then I thought to myself, well, hang on, how big can we make this? And uh, now we've got a thousand speakers, probably going to be half a million people booked in the embodiment conference it's called the embodiment conference.org all the top names in trauma and yoga in uh, meditation martial arts free to the world and um, we we make our money by buying the record people buy the recordings but it's totally free if people want to listen into it it's the embodiment conference.org and um I'm going to be honest, it's a terrifying proposition. All of a sudden, I'm the mayor of a small town and I'm, you know, a million pounds to do it. Um, and I'm in charge of a team of 60 people. And I'm like, you know, I'm used to doing little embodiment trainings for 30 or 50 people. So it's, it's a bit of a step up for me. And um, what can I say? I feel inspired by it. I feel stressed by it. I feel um, uh, happy I'm doing it. I feel frustrated sometimes. It's the full spectrum. It's it's like a Mount Everest to climb. But um, it's happening. It's really happening. So if, if people are at all curious about this stuff, the Embodiment Conference would be a good place to um, get a taste, get a free taste of many, many different approaches, like a kind of tapas meal, you know. When is it? It is the 14th to 25th of October. Uh, it's online. It's free for everyone. Free to register. Real easy to do. And uh, there's 10 different channels running simultaneously 24 hours a day. It's in nine languages as well. So if people want to listen to it in German or Spanish or Chinese or whatever they can. So it's, um, yeah, it's, we think it's the largest educational event in human history. Uh, it's certainly the largest online summit there's ever been. Uh, it's pretty ambitious in its scope. And we've got this very clever computer system some Israeli friends of mine made, which is sort of means you can find what you want rather than just get lost in it. So you can say, right, I want to learn about trauma and I want a beginner's class and I want it next Tuesday. And you just put all that in and uh, you can find what you need. Dude, what an event, man. That is uh, a serious, <laughs> a serious undertaking. You know, someone told me, hey, well, what about next year? I said, I'm not going to go next year. What are you <laughs> no. talking about? This is crazy. Like, so it's, it's really something. And I, I wanted to push it and just see how far it would go and, um, you know, have that personal challenge. And as I said, I think this embodiment is needed in the world today. I, I think we are disconnected from ourselves. And that has pro that leads to all sorts of problems, whether it be health problems, emotional problems. We're disconnected from each other. You know, we're disconnected from the planet. And those those things cannot continue. So even in this weird techie, you know, tuning in online, learning embodiment on the Internet world, we need to find a way to come home to the body. And uh, I hope this is um, some contribution towards that. Awesome, man. I think that's a, a really noble pursuit. And I'm going to guess that this was planned long before COVID kicked off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 18 months in the making. Yet. 2020, probably a pretty good year for people to have this some sense of community, a connection to half a million people. Yeah, I mean, the Facebook ad price came down, if nothing else, you know. But um, <laughs> it was, I mean, I'm joking. I don't wish COVID on anyone. It can be nasty, particularly for elderly people, can't it? But um, I think a lot of people isolated, stuck indoors, uh, having, we've done a lot of lead up events to this. We did events on stress and trauma and, you know, all different things like that. And you could see it was really beneficial for people to, even if they were in the house, to be able to connect with other people. Um, that feels like a worthwhile thing to be putting out there and, you know, giving some of the, the skills and the experts and just making it globally available for everyone online. So um, I'm proud of it, to be honest, mate. I feel like we've already achieved something just getting to this point. And, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a test for me as a leader. It's not always easy, but um, I'm proud we're doing it. Congratulations, man. People want to check it out. Where do they go? the embodiment conference.org or if they just google embodiment conference 
Uh, if people like what I've been hearing and saying here as well, they can look at YouTube channels about it, the podcast. I've got a book out called Embodiment. Basically, if you start Googling the word embodiment, you're going to come up with all this stuff. And there's loads of free resources online. So, um, yeah, I want to encourage people to look up those. And there's lots of other teachers in this field, not just me. And if I'm not your cup of tea, you might like Paul Linden, Richard Strezzi Heckler, Wendy Palmer. There's a whole load of great teachers out there in the world. I love it. Everything that we've gone through will be linked in the show notes below. I'll be tuning in, I think. I'll uh, ask you for your uh, your top superstars from the conference. It'll be like asking you to choose your favorite Ooh. children or something. Ooh. I'm Fred, gonna... I have to tell you offline. Yeah, well. I was going to say, I'm going to ask for the secret. It's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit political, that. <laughs> the, su- the super secret best of guest list, and I'm going to get. I'm, uh, I'm going to tune in and do that. Mark, today's been really, really fun, man. I really enjoyed it, and I think that the concepts that we've gone through hopefully will help a lot of people. Like I say, anyone that's interested in finding out a little bit more about this, I'll have linked most of the stuff that you need, or if not, just search Mark Walsh or the Embodiment Conference online, and you'll be able to find out some more. For now, man, thank you so much. Thanks for your time, Chris. Pleasure.